Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. In all the preaching that is being done around the world, especially in North America, I'm observing something that there are two time periods that very few people ever hear taught about. And I want to explain to you what those two, two time periods are. One is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. If I were to take a survey, and I'm not going to do it, uh, with all the people here, which are about 300 people, and I were to say, how many of you have ever heard a pastor stand up and say, I'm going to teach what's going to happen during the thousand year reign. Let's just do that. How many of you have ever heard an entire message on the millennial reign of Jesus? Raise your hand. 15 people out of 300? Wait a minute. If we're going there, how come we're not talking about it? Uh, come on. Now, here's, the, here's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the eighth millennium. I'm going to talk about life in the eighth millennium because here's something you never hear taught on. What happens at the end of the thousand years? Where do we go from there? What is it all about? Now, before I begin today, let me just welcome our manifest audience around the world and also those that are with us in Israel here, our tour group. This is tour group, tour group. There's your, there's your signal. <laughs> there's your signal. In the Bible, their biblical numbers have a, a definite meaning. Six, is, of course, is the number of man. Seven is the number of perfection and completion. And I shared something the other day that I want to repeat here on the program. When you get to the number eight, eight is always a number of new beginnings. There were eight souls in the ark, the ark that repopulated the earth after the flood. A Jewish child was circumcised on the eighth day, introducing him into his beginning of his covenant with God. Also, there were eight steps that go up into the millennial temple where we will worship the Lord one day when he returns and sets up his kingdom. The Bible tells us that after eight days, Jesus was transfigured. And notice after that uh, that period of time. And also after eight days, Jesus appeared to his disciples. And when he was uh, appeared to Mary, uh, eight days passed and he then appears to Thomas. Eight is always connected to a number of new beginnings. Now what I'd like to do for a moment is share with you some of the early church fathers theories. We're not going to take the time to tell who they were and when they lived and all that. But there was a theory that started developing right after the ascension of Christ and it was called the six days of creation and the 6,000 year theory. Most of you have heard this. And that is that there, as there were six days of creation, each day represents a thousand years because the Bible says one day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. Then on the seventh day, God rested. Now I heard a comedian, I don't think he's very funny to be honest with you, but he was on television, he's an agnostic, and he said, yeah, these crazy Christians, can you believe these idiots don't believe in evolution? Sir, you may have come from a monkey, but I didn't. Okay, but let me say this and, and this, and the second thing he said is, and ha believing in a God that gets so tired he has to rest after his creation. That's not what the Bible says. The reason God rested on the seventh day, sir, he had already created everything and wasn't nothing else to create. And the reason he's resting on the seventh day is he's back looking at everything he did and bragging on it. It's all good. And the third reason he rested on the seventh day was because he is giving a pattern of what his children are to do. Exodus says you work six days, the seventh day you don't work. Six years of work, seventh year. I better not say that to my staff. You know, I get in trouble saying that. Six years of work, seven years you don't work. But there wasn't, there was, it was an agriculture society. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but follow me carefully. Now, what, when we talk about the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ, here's how it works. The early fathers, many of them believed that there'd be 6,000 years of man's government from Adam all the way to the time when Jesus would set up his kingdom on earth. 6,000 years or six days. Now we don't know, do you start timing it from the creation of Adam? Do you start timing it at the fall in the garden? We don't know when that was. Do you start timing it when Adam is 130 years of age and he has his uh, first son born outside of Cain and Abel? He has the replacement born, uh, Seth. Do you start timing it there? So no one can figure out when is the 6,000 years. But however, in the book of Revelation chapter 20, there's about six times it mentions the word, we shall, they shall rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years. 
Now this thousand years is recognized by many of the fathers. There are people who don't believe in it, don't believe it's going to happen, but I'd rather trust the Bible than them. Hmm. And in this 1,000 years, it actually can be identified, now watch the phrase, all through the Bible as the day of the Lord. I don't know if you've noticed how many times in the Bible, the Old Testament talks about the day of the Lord is at hand, the day of the Lord. Now I got very, um, um, not, I won't say confused, but I was just concerned when I would read one uh, prophet and the day of the Lord was great and wonderful and the lion lays down beside the lamb and the, the, the child can play with the snake and the snake's not going to bite it. Talk about a snake handler. Snake handling's coming, folks. I, no, not really, not really. But it says that it, the child will play in, the, in, the, in the, the den of a cockatrice or a serpent and it, he won't be afraid of it. In other words, there'll be no fear of the animal kingdom is what he's saying there. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, got, I start reading things like that, and then I'll turn right around and read another prophet talking about the day of the Lord. He says, it's a day of judgment. It's a day of gloom. It's a day of destruction. And I'm saying, okay, this is why people criticize the Bible and say it contradicts itself. Because one guy says this, one guy says that. And I said, Lord, what are you talking about? Now, I want you to listen to this. The day of the Lord, one day with the Lord is? A thousand, years. thousand years is? There is one day time when? Armageddon happens that unless he interrupts, unless Jesus comes back and returns, no flesh will be saved. The Armageddon armies are marching to Jerusalem. The blood is up to the horse's bridle. That's in one day. In a 24-hour period, all that happens. But watch this. In a 24-hour period, while that's going on, Jesus comes back with the armies of heaven, Revelation 19. Jesus steps foot on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14. Satan is bound by an angel of God in the book of Revelation. And it all happens, ready, in a day the day of the Lord. So on one hand, the day of the Lord's terrible. On the other hand, the day of the Lord's great because deliverance has come. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Then the day of the Lord is a thousand years. Now in, in, in Paul's writing in the book of Hebrews, you will find over and over again where he talks about entering into rest. And he compares the children of Israel. And he says the children of Israel, because of their unbelief, could not enter into rest. I believe, and I'm trying to go from memory here, but I believe the word rest is used by Paul approximately 11 times comparing Israel's unbelief, not being able to enter the promised land, and how he warns believers to be careful not to fall into unbelief lest they fall short of God's blessing. In the 11 times that Paul talks about rest, he uses a specific word that means to recline, to rest, or to relax. One time, in fact, I think I have this here somewhere. One time in Hebrews chapter 4 and 9, he uses the word rest, and it's the Greek word sabbaton. And that is, ready, the great Sabbath. Now, all these other times, he's talking about just resting and relaxing and entering into God's presence. But then he talks there, lest you have an evil heart of unbelief where you cannot enter into your, watch this, eternal rest. What is the eternal rest? It is known by Jews as the great Sabbath. So in other words, Paul warned the church, be careful that you fall back into unbelief and you're not accounted worthy to enter into what? That great rest, which means to rule and reign with Christ during that time frame when we're all together in our eternal rest. Doesn't mean the grave, by the way. All right? Now, having said that, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the one thousand. How many of you, how many of you would like to hear me sometime teach on the 1,000 year reign? You know? We may do that at a conference. We'll, we'll lay out maps. We'll show you how big Jerusalem will be. We'll show you where the farming area will be. We'll show you where we'll be, we'll be living. And that would be an interesting teaching. But here's, here's the part I want to get to. The, at the conclusion of the 1,000 year reign of Christ, the Bible tells us a couple of things are going to happen. And this is what I want to make clear to you. And I'm going to do this kind of from memory and kind of put some things together if I can. We find out that there's two judgments that take place in heaven. The first judgment is found in Revelation chapter 11, right at the end of the verse, verse 18. And John says that he's in heaven, he sees the temple of God open in heaven, he sees the Ark of the Covenant, and it says, Now has come the time to judge the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name. And that judgment there is identified as what we call in English the judgment seat of Christ, or the, the Bible identifies it. And the Greek word there is bima. The bema was, and I, I can use this uh, area where we're at in Bethshan, Bethshan to describe this to you. The congregation of men sat here, and then there was a race platform. And on the race platform, that was called a bema. And actually, in the uh, time of uh, the, what we call the Olympics, if the, Olymp the Olympics came out of the Greek-Roman culture, 
In that time, the bema was where the judge sat, where when you ran the race successfully, you would go and be up on a race platform. You know they do it in the Olympics today. They put the winner here and the two here. You go on the race platform and then he awards you publicly for what you have done. So this is, a, this is the idea of the bema. It's a reward ceremony for those who have faithfully followed the Lord and worked for the Lord. I tease folks, I say this. I say, I'm working on a crown so big that somebody who didn't get one's got to haul mine around. <laughs> You know, I'm talking about, I'm talking about like on a U-Haul. You understand what I'm saying? A U-Haul with gold rims. Come on, boys. Gold rims that spin. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I, I said, where'd that crown come from? By oh, that stone's crown. You know, big as the Eiffel Tower. When you put it on, you got to walk like this. You know what I mean? And, and I do tease. I do everything I do with one thought in mind. I want to I hear Jesus say, well done. And I want to get a great reward for him. And I mean that very sincerely. Now, that judgment is for the believers. You have to have been in heaven and be caught up. And you're, The dead are raised, the dead in Christ, and the living have been caught up. Now, that's in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. That is the judgment for the believers. Now, the next judgment is set at the end of the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. This judgment in, mentioned in the book of Revelation is called the Great White Throne Judgment. Now, this is when everyone from Adam, let's say if Cain killed Abel, if Cain did not make his heart right with God, then Cain will be the first person from the old age to stand there. And it will go all the way through to the New Testament people who lived at that time, all the way through to the people who died in the millennial reign. Meaning there are human beings here on earth during the thousand years. We will not die again. We will have a resurrected body during the 1,000 years. But all the people living on earth during the thousand years in a physical body will have to experience death. So at some point that happens. Now, God will take everybody from the time of Adam to the end of the thousand years who are lost, who, who died without the Lord. And he will take their souls and spirits out of hell. This is what the Bible teaches. It says, death and hell give up the dead that are in it. And those individuals will stand before God. Now, there's going to be something else. No, very few people catch this. The Bible says that Paul wrote, do you not know that we will judge the angels? Can you imagine? Oh, watch out. I'm about to go. Satan is going to have to be judged. Demons are going to have to be judged. Every angel that fell was Satan. And do you know who's going to judge them? I, I mean this, and I know this is going to sound goofy. I wish that God would let me, before he sends Satan to the pit, just kick him one time. <laughs> I'm a, I'd say this is behalf, on behalf of all my partners and all my friends that you harassed and me. I just want to kick him one good time. But now the point is, Satan, fallen angels, all sinners, none of them are in the Bema in chapter 11. They're in the white throne judgment, which comes up, Later on, you, you, if, in fact, if you go to Revelation 19 and 20 and 21, that is your millennial scriptures and your eighth millennium scriptures. What is the eighth millennium? Here it is. It's what begins at the end of the thousand years. We enter into what I call, we enter into the eighth millennium. And you ready for this one? That one don't end. That one is when we forget about all time. That's when we have the resurrected body. That's when the new Jerusalem comes down to earth. Okay, now, let me give you some, some, some things here that I've written down very quickly. Uh, number one, here's some misconceptions. Misconception number one about heaven is that we will live forever in heaven. In reality, we will actually be in heaven during the tribulation period, according to the book of Revelation, where we have to get the bema. We have to, first of all, we're going to worship the lamb. And then we're going to appear before the bema to get our reward. And then at Revelation 19, we will attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, in, in the Old Testament, when a husband and wife were married, when a couple was married, they took a year off of work, and they actually, the wedding supper lasted seven days, but they for one year did not work. I believe that is a picture of that the last year of the tribulation, the seventh year, remember seven is always a day of what? Rest. We are going to eat for a year. We're going to be at the marriage supper. <laughs> Look, this bunch likes that. It's the eatingest bunch you ever saw in your life every time you turn. We got food. Where's food? Come on. <laughs> Americans eat more than anybody else. But I do believe it's a picture. The fact of a husband and wife taking a year off is a picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb, which would be 
the last year of the seven-year tribulation. Remember, six years of tribulation, but you have a seventh year, right? Daniel 9, 27, Matthew 24, etc. That year, Revelation 19, we're at the marriage supper, and at the end of the supper, we return with the Lord to earth. Now, that's the thousand-year reign. But we do not, and this is a real, this gets picky with people, we do not spend forever in heaven. We come back and, and rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Then what happens, watch this, New Jerusalem comes down to earth. And that's where we live. So we actually, now, will we have access to heaven? Oh yeah. I got to tell you something funny. When I wrote this book called Scenes Beyond the Grave, I, I, God began, it was the easiest book I've ever written in my life. I could not type fast enough. And it was just revelation. I, and my hair was, let's do it right now. My hair would just stand up. I'd say, oh Lord, I never saw that before. Can you imagine having a resurrected body that like Jesus could go through a door that's shut, and like Jesus could be here and think and be over there. Now watch this. Can you imagine trying to play hide and seek? <laughs> I mean, that's how my mind works. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, my little girl, all kids love to hide. Your little girl will go hiding. Where's she at? Where's she at? I mean, can you imagine right when you found them, they disappear? <laughs> there will be, <laughs> there will be no games of hide and seek in heaven. <laughs> You know, or can you imagine having that kind of a body where you can think just like Jesus or the angels does and you can think and be here and say, well, let's go to Jerusalem and you just join hands. It's like Star Trek. Beam me up, Scotty. And the next thing you know, you're in Jerusalem. I mean, can you imagine? Oh, come on, help me. Now, the, the second thing you're not going to have in heaven is running a race. Y'all get this in a minute. Okay, <laughs> on your mark, everybody's lined up. A street 1,500 miles long, right? We're going to run it, baby. We ready? We're going to run. We're going to see and get to the end of it. Are you ready? <laughs> on your mark, get set, go. Ping. Hello! <laughs> <laughs> You're already at the end of it. Who won? It's a photo finish, but they all got here at the same time. I mean, I'm writing this book, you know, and my mind is just, I'm sitting there laughing at myself, thinking we have never experienced anything like this. He look, heaven's going to be amazing, but to be able to have a body that doesn't have pain, doesn't have all the junk we got to put up with down here, that's going to be great. Well, let me get, let me get to these other, I got sidetracked there for a minute. Okay. Number two is there are people, let me read the verse, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire to the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Second Peter three and seven. Then 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be destroyed, uh, dissolved, what manner of persons are you to be? And he talks about that. And then he comes on down here, and this is the part I want to read, that when the elements melt with fervent heat, nevertheless, according to his promise, we look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, some people think that when you read this verse, that what God's going to do is he's going to just set all the heavens on fire and then he's going to just destroy the earth completely and create like a brand new planet. It appears though that, you know, there's words in the Bible that could be new, but it's not necessarily new like brand new. It's renewed. Uh, you cannot put new wine in old bottles, but you put new wine in new bottles. That word new there does not mean a brand new and go kill the old and get rid of it, throw it away. It means renew it, to renew the wine skin. So I believe it's possible that he doesn't just do away with this planet and obliviate it because he's got verses in the Bible that talks about as the sun and moon and stars are, you know, forever and the earth is forever and it's the Lord's. What he does is he literally sets the whole planet on fire and renovates it and starts all over again. And here's what's interesting. Do you know when John saw the New Jerusalem come down, what's the one thing he said? There was no more sea. Why would, how do you get rid of the sea? Come on, talk to me. How do you get rid of water? Heat. What's it do? Evaporates. So when God sets the world, world, world on fire to renovate it, to purge it, to cleanse it, to sanctify it, that's when then the New Jerusalem will come down and he will actually have recreated this planet. And so uh, we, we always tell folks, come to Israel while you can. <laughs> come to Israel and get a look at, look, at, look, at, look at it before the millennial reign. You know what I mean? Now, here's the third thing I want to share with you, and I think this is very important. Uh, God says this, For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come into mind, Isaiah 65 and 17. Um, there are people that have said to me, and they say this sincerely, they'll say, you know, I had a dad that was just absolutely, totally wicked. 
He was the meanest man on earth. One man told me, I stood at my dad's deathbed and asked him to repent. And he said, I don't need God or you. And he died. He said, I know my dad's lost. He said, but I still love my dad. And he said, Perry, if I go to heaven, if, well, I have a memory that I had a father who didn't make it there. And the answer is no. I think one of the worst parts, can I say this? I think one of the worst parts about eternity would be that people, according to Luke 16, who have passed away, they remember. They remember their life. They remember uh, messages. They remember their family members. But we will get to heaven and God will wipe away every tear from our eye. Now, this sounds so harsh to say it. But if you have people that did not make it there, it will be as though you never knew them. Because how could it be heaven if you knew that? And I don't understand how God's going to do all these things, but I do know that the heavenly realm or the spirit realm that we will have in that time. So here's, here we go back real quick. I'm running out of time. The millennial reign is a thousand years. When I talk about life in the eighth millennium, what I'm talking about is at the end of the thousand years when we go into there, it will not be an eighth millennium in this term of an eighth one thousandth year. It will be the beginning of the eighth millennium of time in which everything is new. Why? Because eight is the number of new beginnings. New heaven, new earth, new beginnings. In the dead of winter, come warm yourself by the fire, the bonfires of Winter Reformation Weekend. Join Perry Stone January 23rd through 25th for a winter weekend of wisdom, music, inspiration, and worship. For more information and to register for this free event, go online to OCIMinistries.org. Come out of the cold, join us, and rekindle the flames of your Winter Reformation. This March, a generation of warriors is assembling at Omega Center International in Cleveland, Tennessee, arming themselves for battle with teachings from Perry Stone, Damon Thompson, and Mark Casto, with music from Eddie James, Bryn Waddell, and OCI's First Hearts. Register free online at www.ociministries.org. Warrior Fest 2015, where lambs become lions. I have in my hand six important prophetic updates and I want to get this into your hand. I have personally selected these messages from recent conferences that I've taught in North America. The first audio CD is called The Mystery of the Great Sabbatismos. The Apostle Paul talks about entering into our rest and he uses a particular Greek word that means to cease from labor. One time he uses the word for the Sabbath. I'm going to take that word and show you how the Sabbath principle of every seventh day, seventh year, and Jubilee years tie into the return of the Lord and our time of eternal rest. The second message is called Yom HaKissah, the mystery of the hidden day. This was one of the most fascinating messages that we taught last year. This message deals with how the moon is concealed during the time of the Feast of Trumpets and how it's called a hidden day and it ties into the rapture of the church and the coming of Jesus Christ. The third audio CD is called Second Coming Secrets Revealed in Priestly Rituals. We're going to show you the Old Testament priestly rituals and how those rituals actually conceal second coming secrets concerning Jesus, our high priest, who will soon return to earth to become King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The fourth audio CD is called The Prophetic Mystery of the Joseph Code. Did you know that concealed in the story of Joseph, when he revealed himself to his brothers, is the story of how that the church must be taken out and then God will reveal the Messiah to the nation of Israel. This is truly an outstanding message for you to hear. Then one of my favorites of all time, living in prophetic crunch time. We're going to show you specific dates in major prophetic events and how as it came time for that event to be fulfilled, time became crunched. I tell you, you will enjoy listening to this one. Then finally, the sixth audio CD in this series that I call my six most important prophecy updates is the message I call the spirit of Antichrist and the wearing down of the saints. This exposes why and how weariness is going to be one of the big end time attacks against the church and against believers. Now you can get this, these six audio CDs in this brand new album, ones I have personally selected for you by doing the following. You can call 1-888-21-BREAD, that's a toll free number. Go to perrystone.org and order online 
or write me at Perry Stone PO Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320. We're asking for a donation of $30 or more. Now remember this, that when you support us through our resource material, you help keep Manifest on the air. I know so many of you comment on, Perry, we want to hear prophetic teaching in the season that we're now in. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you have an opportunity to hear it when you order this album. God bless you and thank you for your support of Manifest. Well, trust you enjoyed today's program. This will be the last opportunity you have during the Manifest telecast to get the six important prophecy updates, which are the six messages that we've selected. You just saw them advertised. Please get those. Also, uh, we just want to remind you, you saw about the tabernacle teaching. That's coming up. Reformation's coming up. And Reformation, uh, we need you to register at OCIMinistries.org. Hit the button of Reformation. Let us know you're coming. There's no fee to attend, but we need to know you're coming to prepare seating for you and make sure that everything is going to be great for that great, great, great. I just can't wait. Winter Reformation is so exciting. God does so much by His Holy Spirit during that time. A couple places we're coming to. We announce again January the 30th, Friday night, all day Saturday, which is 10 and 6, Sunday at 9 and 11. There's no Sunday night service at Tampa. This this year, just two Sunday morning services, City Life Church, Tampa, Florida. All right. Then we're going to be coming to the Church Alive, Pastor Randy Long, Conway, Arkansas, Friday at 7, Sunday at 10 and 6, Sunday, I'm sorry, Saturday at 10 and 6, Sunday at 10, 30 and 6. And this is a great church. We, it, we went there with Karen Wheaton recently. It was unbelievable, the anointing. It's going to be a great conference. Denver, Colorado, Sunday, March the 22nd. And that will be Dr. Chris Hill's church. I'm preaching in the 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock service. Now, folks, if you live in the Colorado in the state, come and be with me at Dr. Hill's church. I've never been to Colorado. This is my first trip. Pastor uh, J.C. Church at Tr Victory and Truth Ministries there in uh, Osiris, Ohio, one service only, Wednesday at 7. And then we're going to uh, be coming. I want to also add, I, I, I kind of skipped over this inadvertently, a uh, Free Chapel Worship Center, February the 27th through the 1st of March. And uh, that's going to be a great meeting in Irvine, California. Let me just say something that when we tape these programs, we're doing them way in advance, and sometimes we will book a weekend meeting, and we don't have a lot of time to advertise it. Uh, so if you will, go to, the, go to perrystone.org to see where we're coming to, to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, you didn't miss a meeting and maybe we were in your area. Sometimes people will say, I didn't know you were coming, or I didn't know you would be there, or I, I would have come to the meeting. Now, and we've got some great things planned this year at Omega Center International, Warrior Fest, the International Prophecy Summit, the Mentoring Institute. We've got the Partners Conference in, in, in the month of uh, uh, June. Also, Partners, don't forget, we're going back to Israel for a Partners Only Tour and a main tour in the month of November. We now have that information available on our website. Follow us on Perry Stone Ministries Facebook page and keep up with us through uh, the Voice of Evangelism Ministries and also uh, the, the, the uh, web page that we have. Social media is absolutely incredible. It's one of the most amazing things to know that we can be alive and stay in touch with the entire world through social media. And we'd love to stay in touch with you and minister to you that way. Thank you for your prayers. Don't forget to get the album. Last opportunity for that. Trust the messages will be a great encouragement to you. See you next week. Now available in bookstores everywhere. Perry Stone's prophetic book, Deciphering End Time Prophetic Codes. Get your copy today.